So the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about what it looks like for us to get stronger. Uh, we've been talking about building stronger families, stronger relationships, uh, and, and what it looks like for us to really grow the root system of our life. We talk about growth a lot in our personal lives, of course, in our finances. Uh, we talk about it in our church. But what we don't always talk about is the root system that's needed to sustain growth. Fast growth uh, of a plant or something without roots just falls over. That The reality is that we can't just grow rapidly in our lives, but we've got to grow uh, deep. And so we don't want to grow, uh, go wide or high, but we want to grow deep. And we know the deeper we grow in our relationships, family, our relationship with God, and so on, um, the stronger we're going to be. And so we've been talking about what that looks like for us. And so uh, this morning I'm going to read again Matthew 7 as our kind of theme verse throughout this uh, conversation. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who builds his house on the rock, the rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it did not collapse because the foundation was the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. And its collapse was great. That the reality for you and me is that we invest our time in building a strong foundation. Our collapse, we will not collapse. If we'll invest our time and energy and effort, make sure that the foundation of our lives is centered on Jesus Christ. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about marriage. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I think this is the first time I've talked about marriage in, uh, in, in this facility since, since we've been here. Uh, I, I love to talk about marriage and I also hate to talk about it. I love to talk about it because it is so essential to our lives. I'm tired of seeing marriages fail and people's lives uh, collapsed and, and I'm tired of seeing things broken. What I know about my own life is that when my marriage is uh, not working the way it should and we're not clicking, uh, it affects everything else in my life. So I understand personally how important it is to have a strong marriage. But I hate talking about it for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, if you're not married, it sometimes is isolating. So one of the challenges that I have here is to be able to make sure we're reaching, you know, this morning we had some 92-year-olds in the room, and, and so we got to reach 92-year-olds, and we got to connect with people who are here who may be not married. And so I want you to know if you're not married, single, divorced, widowed, whatever that looks like for you, lean in. There's always something to be found as we talk about the foundation of our lives and building stronger. This information applies to you even if you're not married uh, because you have a responsibility as well to prepare your life for uh, your future. That there are people that will come into your life if you're unmarried who, whose intent is to destroy you. Maybe they don't know it, but the enemy uses people to come into your life to destroy you, to detour you. And so it's important that you ground your life in, in scriptures and that you understand uh, who you are. And you don't try to become the person uh, that somebody expects you to be, but you be who God has created you to be so that you prepare your life for your future. If you're widowed here, understand how important it is that you Invest in others' marriages, that you understand the struggles of marriage so you pray and you support other people who are married or newlyweds. But the other reason I don't like talking about marriage is because typically when someone talks about something from a stage like this with lights like these, they assume you're an expert. We have a, a society built on experts. Everybody's an expert in something, and, and I'll be honest, I'm an expert in nothing. So uh, I, I don't want you to at any point think David's got it mastered. If you feel like that, just you can talk to Margie and she'll let you know how uh, I do not have marriage mastered. So what I want to do is I want to talk from my own personal perspective. I want to talk from my own struggles. And I don't want to say, I'm strong, be strong like us. What I want to say is, um, we struggle too, and we're going to struggle together and get stronger together. Because that's what we do in community. The, the church is not a perfect place trying to project onto you how you can be perfect. The church is a hospital of broken people trying to work through our brokenness together. And so today we're talking about what it looks like for us to build the foundation of our life. The foundation of our life, uh, any great life, is love. When we had our home inspected, uh, they go through all the aspects and facets of the home, and then they get to the foundation, right? And they want to check the foundation of your house before you purchase it. And, and our home happened to have a, a beam that was going across the bottom, and it had a crack in it. And we were like, ah, that sounds awful. I don't know how bad it really was, but it a crack in your foundation beam sounds, sounds pretty bad. And so we're like, can you fix it? And they probably did. We didn't check it, but they should have. The idea is that our house is still standing. So we're going to assume that that's taken care of. If not, we'll figure that out. But the reality is that the foundation of our life is love. And some of us, we have some cracks. And a lot of times you don't recognize those cracks because you're not really self-aware. You're not inspecting your life at, at a detailed level, just like you don't inspect your home every year uh, like you would when you first purchase it. 
We're not inspecting our lives. What's your foundation? What is your life built on? That the, that the moment we lose love for one another, we develop cracks in our foundation. And a lot of times we don't recognize it until it's too late. But if we stop loving one another, not just your spouse, but your family, your friends, the people in our community, we've lost a genuine love for humanity. And the moment we do, we start to develop these cracks But what's fascinating to me is that uh, we need love and we need to understand love as the foundation, but love as a definition in society has changed over uh, centuries. Early on uh, in in, in our time, if you look back through history, the earliest marriages, they had nothing to do with attraction or love. They had everything to do with power. Marriage originally rose as a way to uh, share resources and consolidate power to to expand empires and and to uh, reinforce power. Marriage was used as a method of trading and and gaining, and and it was looked at as a business transaction. Uh, One king would marry his daughter to another so that their empires would would grow, that marriage was seen as a way to build political alliances. And and even lower classes throughout history would, would marry for practical purposes. They'd marry, if you were a farmer, you'd go look for someone who, uh, you know, was a hard worker who could work the farm, and you'd marry so that your farm could be stronger. If you were a baker, you'd go look for a a baker so that your bakery could thrive. And so marriage was looked at in a more uh, practical sense. People married uh, for financial and practical reasons. And it wasn't until the 19th century that this Jane Austen view of love and marriage started to filter into the U.S. and it started to build momentum. This idea of marrying for love was birth. And it wasn't, uh, oh, it was quite novel at the time with the rise of this new idea. Marrying for love came this idea that you have to, uh, opposites attract. This concept that, you know, you got to marry somebody who's not like you so that their weaknesses become your strengths and vice versa. And, and so there was this, you know, 40s, 50s, even 60s, we developed these strong uh, roles for males and females. Males went to work and women took care of the home and the kids. And, and that's sort of where we get this modern uh, this, uh, construct from uh, modern just kind of shifting but there's this idea that you had to marry your opposite, but then all of a sudden the 70s came around and we started seeing divorce rates climb. 70s and 80s, the divorce rate starts rising. And as a culture, we collectively, the collective think, decided that maybe marriage wasn't based on opposites attracting. Maybe it's uh, commonality. So people started marrying who had, you know, socioeconomic status uh, lining, uh, lining, and they married for uh, same sort of ideas and, and theories and, and, and theologies and cultural backgrounds and, and education. And, and the point is that throughout history, the definition of love has changed. The reason people got married and, and, and stayed married shifted and changed throughout history. And it'll shift and change. It's always evolving. The reason we married 100 years ago won't be the reason we marry uh, in 100 years if we're all still around. Uh, Well, we won't be, but people will be. And the idea is that it's always shifting and changing. And the challenge that we have and that's constantly in front of us is to make equality appealing. Where there's excitement in compromise and uh, child care pickup and doctor's appointments where we find it's interesting to drive a minivan and whatever stage of life you're in, retirement and, and all of these where we don't get stuck. Because I feel like one of the greatest challenges that marriages face today, regardless of how old you are and how long you've been married, one of the greatest challenges we face is suffocation. When we get bored, stuck in a rut. And regardless of why you married and regardless of, uh, you know, the, the, the decade that you married and, and kind of your mindset and, and where you're at, what I know is that it's become vital that we do not look to culture to provide for us the definition of love. But we look to the source. We look to the scriptures. And in 1 Corinthians 13, we have a wildly popular verse. If you've ever been to a wedding, if you've ever uh, been in any environment where uh, love is described, this passage is inevitably read but it's largely misunderstood. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, If I speak human or angelic languages, but I do not have love, I'm a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body in order to boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. This passage is frightening. It's terrifying. 
It's describing this reality that you and I could move mountains with our faith, whether that's physical or, or spiritual, whether that's practical or whether that's metaphorical. Uh, it doesn't matter. We can move mountains with our faith, but not have love, and it would be nothing. We could come to a place where we give everything that we own away to feed the poor, which sounds like a noble thing, but do it without love and have nothing and I wonder how many times in my life have I moved and spoke and, 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 and done things without love. And it was just a clanging cymbal. It was just a loud racket. Because without the foundation of love, everything else is meaningless. And in the context of church, we talk about faith. And we talk about hope and how important these things are. But they are nothing without love. So it starts with us understanding what it means to love one another. But we are so bad at it. We are terrible as human beings at loving one another. We might be able to muster up the love for somebody that gives something back to us. We might be able to show love to our spouse for a while until things get challenging. We might be able to show a little bit of love to someone who is kind or has a friendly face. But we are so bad at loving people in general and it's tearing our society apart. And what the scripture continues to remind us of is how critical it is that we exemplify, that we understand and we show love at every front and when it comes to the context of marriage, we have to understand what real love looks like. And I'll be honest, the best word that I can use to describe love is work. Work is the best word that we could supplement for love because love requires, it demands work. And I think this is why so many marriages don't survive. I think this is why so many friendships and communities of faith fall apart. It's because love looks like work and we are work aversive. We do not want to engage in anything that becomes complicated. We might physically work. And there's something kind of masculine about physically getting ready to do some, you know, hard labor. And we can take pride and sweat from our brow. But if you're going to ask us to be patient, you're going to ask us to be kind, you're going to ask us to, uh, you know, exemplify love in, in a way that's not overtly masculine, that becomes challenging. It's easy to take a bullet for your spouse because that feels like the right thing to do. But doing the dishes, I don't know. Changing the diaper, I don't know. You know what I mean? Because love looks like work, but it doesn't look like work like we often imagine. That marriage takes work and it takes patience. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, it continues. This is love is patient and love is kind. It isn't boastful and it isn't conceited. The work that requires uh, for any strong marriage is to be patient and, and kind. And this is an emotional amount of work. We can do physical work, but the emotional, uh, many of us, male and female, start to check out that we often want our relationships to, to be perfect. And, and, and we want our marriages to be perfect, and we want to be able to watch a television show from, you know, the, the 90s and 2000s and model our lives after that and go, I want a marriage like that, but the idea of perfection is unattainable. My wife didn't marry a perfect person. I tried to warn her. So therefore, our marriage will never be perfect. Many people say they're looking for the perfect church, and, and the saying goes, it's perfect until you get there, because we're all imperfect people, bound and broken by sin, living largely selfish lives, that marriage takes two people who are broken by sin, who are selfish by nature, and it pairs them together, and all of a sudden we go, well, this should be perfect. We shouldn't have fights, we shouldn't have problems, it should all just work. But the problem is, and you're not going to want to hear this, but your marriage will never be perfect because you're not perfect. And even worse, we're not willing to admit that we're not perfect, right? We don't want to admit it. We would rather assume that the other person is imperfect. We can easily go, well, you're not perfect and you're not perfect. And here's your flaws and here's your problems and here's what you do wrong. And it's easier to do that than to go, what is actually inside of me? Can I actually admit that we're all imperfect? See, the work that it takes to have a strong relationship in your life is being stronger in yourself. The work that it takes to have a stronger marriage begins with you, and it begins with me. That the work starts with me. And if you want a stronger marriage, become a stronger follower of Christ. If you want a stronger relationship or friendships, if you want a stronger community of faith, then become stronger in your walk with God. That if you are married and you're having issues, and if you're married, you're having some kind of issues, you need to work on you. I had a friend of mine call me 
a, a while ago, I had done his wedding ceremony a couple of years ago, and he called me up, and, and he was like, he was f- really dis- despondent, and he was like, hey, I'm, I, 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 we're really having problems, and I don't know what to do, and, and, and I said, you can't fix her, so work on you. And when I said it, I was like, wait, that might have been, that might have been right. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you say things and you don't know and you have to flesh them out later. That's most of what I do here on stage. I'm like, was that right? Did I agree with what I just said? But it's true. I can't, I can't change Margie. I can't fix Margie. I can't heal Margie. But I can love her. And I'm poor at doing that many times. But the reality is we get into so much conflict in our marriages because we try to fix. And as you're, if you're a man, that's just what we do by nature. We're a fixer most likely. And I don't want to project onto you those specific roles. But the idea is that we generally tend to want to fix things. So when we're hearing problems, we're thinking in our minds, well, I know how to fix that. And then we're, then we're in this conflict because they just want to be listened to. And so there's this idea that we try to fix and we try to heal and we try to protect because we're protectors by nature. But we can't fix, we can't heal, and we can't protect. But we all can love. And there's this idea that we're so bad at loving that we've got to get better at loving, not better at fixing, not get better at at protecting, but get better at loving. And this goes every, it goes against everything that we believe in because if I'm having issues in my life, it's always somebody else's fault. If my marriage isn't working, it's clearly her fault. If my family dynamic's not working, it's clearly other people's fault. If there's problems in our community of faith, it's clearly your fault. It's not mine. That blame is our default. And until we can become self-aware and start being introspective and look deep inside ourselves and say, where have I gone wrong? What do I need to be better at? How can I be stronger? We'll never fix any problem that we have. And a lot of times I can pinpoint problems in my relationships and in my marriage back to my relationship with God. That when things aren't connecting with me and other people, it's generally a sign that things aren't connecting with me and God. And the stronger I get in my relationship with him, the stronger I become for other people because marriage is challenging. Relationships are, ter- are, ter- are difficult. Uh, they're terrible too, but we're not perfect people, so we cannot have perfect relationships. So we have to work on love. But in order to strengthen your marriage, you have to be willing to strengthen you first. That the onus starts with us, that marriage takes work. It takes a lot of work, and it takes time. And if your marriage is weak, it didn't get weak overnight. So it's not going to become strong overnight either. That marriage often falls into a rut over time and we get into patterns and and behavior and it's an attitude here and a few words there. It's a small distance placed between you over time. And what happens is the enemy begins begins to work his way in. There's a a passage in Psalms where uh, the psalmist reminds us to stop the foxes while they're little before they burn the vineyard. And I've always, I often wonder, you know, what does that even mean? That sounds like a, a weird colloquialism or like this weird like haiku. And the reality is people used to tie foxes' tails together, light them on fire, and send them through uh, enemies' fields to burn them down. And what the psalmist is saying is if you'll stop those foxes while they're small, the field won't burn down. See, if you and I can find problems in our marriages that might be tiny or minute, and we can stop those things before they get bigger, We can repent, we can apologize, we can work on them, we can open communication with vulnerability and and, and a commitment to love. Then we can stop them while they're small. Otherwise, we'll die by a thousand cracks. And so many foundations don't just completely crumble, but they start to fall apart because this went unsaid, and this went, uh, and this attitude, and this, this, and this, and then all of a sudden it starts to crumble, and then there's no foundation, and the collapse is great. And for us, choices lead, feelings follow. And a lot of us, we, we choose to love our spouse more than we love anyone else on our planet. But what I've noticed in a lot of marriages that don't work is that they only love when they feel like it. They've adopted this idea that love is a feeling. That marriage is about a feeling. I fell in love. I feel like I'm in love. I mean, I had some tacos downtown in Owensboro, and I thought I was in love for just a moment. They were, you know what I mean? Because feelings follow But choices lead, and if you've committed to someone in the context of marriage, you have now chosen to love that person till death do you part. Now there's some exceptions and abuse and so on, and we'll get into that just a little bit later, but the reality is many of us fall out of love, and that's why marriages collapse, because we think love is a feeling. We've bought into the romantic uh, ideal, the, the movies and the music that tells us that you've got to feel like you're in love, but let's be honest, if you've been married for a while, there's days you don't feel like you're in love. You wake up and you're like, nope, not today. I don't, not me, maybe you, but the idea. 
And I say this in marriage ceremonies when I do it, and, and people chuckle, but we chuckle because it's real. I go, there's going to be days you're going to wake up and not want to say I love you. And it's not because you don't feel like it, it's because you don't feel like it. That doesn't mean things in. That doesn't mean love doesn't exist. That love is a choice. That we must choose to love. We must allow our feelings to dictate what we can't allow them to dictate what we do. Because we have good days and we have bad days. We have good months and bad months. We go ebb and flow. There's mountains and peaks. And so we must love. I choose to love my spouse every day no matter what. And that choice doesn't change with the way I feel. That choice is not based on how I feel in the moment. And if you're not pursuing your spouse, you're generally pursuing someone else's. And someone once told me that, and it's been so, it's, it's constantly in my mind. If you're not pursuing your spouse, you're pursuing someone else because there's this desire to need love in our hearts so much. As human beings, we are hardwired to need love and to give love. And if you're not pursuing your wife, you're pursuing someone else's wife because the, 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 the desire is so strong inside of us, and so we must make sure our emphasis, our effort, our intention is placed on, our, on the person that God has placed in our life because marriage is like climbing a mountain. The views are beautiful from the top, but if you don't have enough oxygen to get there, it'll suffocate. And a lot of marriages take off fast, and they're just so in love, and it's disgusting, and there's no oxygen, there's no roots, there's nothing, there's no sustainability, and it phases. And so for you and I, what I want for us as a church is I want us to have strong marriages, long-lasting. I want our legacy to be that we had a strong marriage for our family. For our kids, we had a marriage that uh, we could model for our family. We have lives that we can model for the people that we're in community with. But in order for us to have strong marriages, we have to commit to our spouse daily. Daily, we have to wake up and choose to commit. I choose you today. I choose you today. We must be quick to forgive, quick to apologize, patient and kind. We must put the work, the emotional work. We must commit now to strengthen the root system. The second thing is that we have to make our spouse priority. We commit daily. We make them priority. You and I need to make our marriages priority and be willing to invest in them. Uh, someone once told me that counseling and, and flowers and date nights are cheaper than divorce court and alimony. Right, Johnny Depp? It's a lot cheaper <laughs> to make sure that you're putting the work in, that you're marrying the right person, and that you're the person that you're supposed to be, right? Because it's a whole lot cheaper to invest in your marriage than it is long term to see the break and the fallout. And the last thing is we've got to be fully present. We've got to be fully present in our lives and in our families, and I'm, I'm guilty of not being fully present. Technology has driven an invisible wedge between all of us. Uh, I was at the ER Saturday with Roman, like I am most Saturdays, because he fell again, and uh, he's fine, but um, it wasted two hours of my life, so I'm still angry. The idea was that I was sitting there, we were waiting for him to get a splint put on his hand, and, and there was a dad and a son, I assumed, sitting across from us, and, and they were on their phones, and 45, I wasn't counting, but it was like 45 minutes. And it's fine, I'm sure they have a fine dynamic and there's no judgment at all, but it was a reminder to me to put my phone up. That sitting there for 45 minutes and engaging in small talk or conversation or whatever we did, uh, watching dumb YouTube videos on the TV was more important because a lot of times we're not fully present in our lives. We're present enough, we're present-ish, and it's hurting us long term. Love is work, we know that. The second thing is love is not about me. Love's not about me, and this, this shifts and changes our definition of love. So often we think, okay, uh, if I'm going to be in marriage, it must make me better, right? You have to love me, and how do you love me, and how do you make me better? How do you make me happy? And everything in our lives is, is centered around me, and we think that love must be about me. And in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it says, love does not envy, it is not boastful. It's not conceited, it does not act improperly, it's not selfish, it's not provoked, it does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. And in 1 Corinthians 13, this definition of love is not a checklist of things to look for in a potential spouse. It's not a checklist of things to take home and be like, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? The idea is this is a list of things that we give. If you were to love the way that Christ has called you to love, this is what love looks like. This is how you live. This is not what they give you, but this is about you and what you provide, that your marriage is about the spouse in which you're in covenant with. The power of covenant love helps us put self in check. And there's a difference between a contract and a covenant, and I don't want to go into it too deep. But nobody frames their, their mortgage papers, you know what I mean? Like, I'm in covenant with the mortgage for, you know, the next 30 years. Let's frame this up, Right? But for whatever reason, we frame up our marriage certificate. Maybe put the vows up. See, marriage is not about the certificate, and I've signed hundreds of them over the years. But it's not about the covenant. I mean, it's not about the contract. It's about the covenant that we are in between us and God. 
that there's this idea that in the last decade, uh, things started shifting in culture where we all of a sudden started thinking that we needed to be happy and we needed our spouse to make us happy. I want to be happy and I need somebody to make me happy. There's a subtle shift in, in our collective think where it says I need, I need joy in my life and I need happiness in my life and my wife is going to provide that. My husband is going to provide that. And so this is what you give me. And we started looking for our partners to make us happy. And the uh, adverse of this is that we begin to project our happiness onto them. I'm only happy when they do this or they say this or they don't do that and they don't say that. And our happiness uh, ebbs and flows with our partner and their ability to meet our expectations. And we started expecting our spouse to help us grow and provide us with happiness. The problem is that too much of a burden is placed on a spouse for them to be able to carry. We've replaced what God should be able to do in our life with what we expect a spouse to do. I can never make my wife happy long term, not even short term. I mean, if you look at Bill Gates and you look at... Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, and they're divorced. That should tell you that money cannot make a woman happy enough or their ability or their status or their power. If they can't do it, what hope do we have? See, we've projected our expectations on to one another to make each other happy, and we cannot do it. It is Christ and Christ alone that can do what, is, what we expect a spouse to do. And a lot of marriages collapse under the burden of expectation. And a lot of us have unspoken expectations, which are the most dangerous kind of expectation, where I expect you to do and say and act like this, but I'm not going to tell you, so I just hope you get it right. And it's like throwing a dart at a board. You may or may not hit it. And the reality is the biblical definition of love does not demand or expect, but it puts others first. And Jesus modeled this with his life on the cross by giving his very life for us. He modeled this in his walk as he walked the earth, as he was constantly uh, sacrificing and giving himself for others. That in my marriage, I'm challenged with putting my spouse above my own needs. And the return is I'm hopeful that she'll put her needs above mine or, or her own. That there's this cyclical love that transpires in any community where we're giving each other Love and compassion and grace and mercy, expecting and hoping, not expecting, but hoping that you'll give back. But regardless of how you reciprocate, we are still responsible for how we act. I can't make you respond. I can't make you love me. In fact, shouting, love me, only makes you love me less. I can't force you into giving me what I desire, but I can shape and change what I give you, what I bring to the table. I can control what I do, and so we have to be aware that when I took the vow to marry my wife, I vowed to honor and love and protect her. And we choose to do this to the best of our ability, but I didn't vow to honor, love, and protect myself. But that's often how I live. That's often how I act. And the reality is that the purpose of marriage is that we believe we're able to do more for the kingdom of God together than we are apart. And I say this a lot in marriages that I do, is that this marriage isn't just about you two anymore, but it's about what your marriage can do. This is not just because Margie and I lead a church, that, that every marriage should have the potential and the capacity to enhance the kingdom of God, that you should be stronger together. You should look at your life and your marriage as a mission, that you can do more for the kingdom of God together. And the enemy knows this. I don't think the enemy cares about your marriage, whether you're married or not, but he knows if he can divide the two of you, he can stop what you're capable of doing. He can stop what God can do through you. That marriage is not just horizontal between you and your spouse, but it's vertical. It's between you, your spouse, and God. And when we bring God into the equation, it shapes and changes. But because we're broken people, our marriages break sometimes. And many of you may know, you may uh, have, have been in a divorce, or a couple of divorces. You may uh, have been in, in, in broken marriages, places where there was abuse, and, and there was uh, moments where you had to step away. And maybe it was uh, regardless of what happened. This is where the grace of God slides in restores and, and rebuilds our ability to love and to trust one another. This is where the grace of God steps in and says, let's love again. I know love hurt you, or someone in the name of love has hurt you. But it's time to love again, time to trust and love again. The third the thing that I want you to know is that love is forever. This feels like a really cushiony thing to say, like love is forever. Write it on a, a card. There's your Mother's Day card saying, if you don't have one yet, I always struggle to find exactly what to say. Like love is forever. You could say a mother's love is forever. That's free. The idea is that we want love to last forever, and it does. And in 1 Corinthians, it says it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never ends, right? So we have to believe that love never ends. Love never ends. However, marriage does. This might be a little controversial, and you can fight me in the parking lot afterwards, but marriage 
isn't for eternity. That Jesus was asked about a woman in uh, Matthew 22. He's asked about a woman who'd been married to multiple people. And they were trying to trap him in a conversation. And they're saying, who's she going to be with in eternity if she's been married multiple times? And Jesus responds with this way in verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. But are like angels in heaven. Now, really quickly, not angels, like angels. But what I want to emphasize is this, this reality that Jesus is saying, for in resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Meaning, we don't have to attend weddings in heaven, right? That's a good thing. We're not marrying in heaven. And that could come across as a little bit harsh, like, well, what's the point, right? Why be married here? Uh, why, why, have, why invest in my marriage here if it's not for eternity? Love is forever. Love never ends. The Bible doesn't teach that there's no marriage in heaven. The Bible actually teaches that there's one marriage in heaven, that Christ is uh, the bridegroom, and we are the bride, and we are all a part of the same marriage that we as a community of faith begin to build and, and strengthen our relationships and our marriage gets stronger when we get closer to Christ. And we're building our marriage. If this is one big marriage in heaven, and if I stay connected to God and I stay connected to my wife, then we'll be a part of the same marriage one day because love does not end. That marriage isn't for eternity, but my relationship with God is. And if I can stay close to God, I can stay close to, to her and to, to all of you because love is forever. And our shared experiences here on earth will will be one that we share in heaven. And this is what makes community so much more important. That when we extend love to one another, we are building something that's lasting longer than than what we can imagine. That marriage will not be for eternity, but the love that is produced here and the children our marriage create will live on in eternity. Back when we were trying, 10 years ago, we were trying to decide if we wanted to have a third kid or just call it a day. And... uh, and uh, I can't tell you which one of us was on each side because our third child's in here. But uh, we were both in favor of whatever God wanted. And so um, somebody told me, they said, uh, children are the only thing that you'll have here on earth that you'll have in eternity. They're the only things you create here on earth that we have in eternity. You don't get to take your stuff with you. But we'll have our children in eternity because love never ends. The love that we're sustaining, the love that we're creating. And this is why we emphasize loving God so much in our home. This is why we want our children to love God so much because we want to spend eternity with them, not apart from them. So the love that we create here lasts forever. And the enemy would love nothing more than to destroy your family, your children, your marriages, not because he cares about them, but because he knows the potential that love has to echo through eternity and so if he can destroy your marriage, he can, he can uh, affect countless number of people, that we have an entire uh, society of broken people, breaking people, hurt people, hurting people. And so we have to stop the cycle, create a marriage that's long-lasting and Christ-centered. The enemy knows that he can work his way in and, and harm your, your witness and, and the effects that you have. The enemy knows he can use a bad relationship. He can use a, 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 a broken person to slide in and to steal from you the things that God wants to protect you from. And so we have to be aware that the enemy is always out to destroy us and to kill us. And he'll use any tool at his disposal. But marriage doesn't always work out, and we understand that. We lean on God, and we trust that a great marriage can only be sustained when both parties realize the source of their strength. It's not in what we can do, but it's when God has already done for us. And we draw from and we rely upon the strength that comes from Christ. So if your marriage is rocky, I challenge you to look at your relationship with God. Look at your relationship with God when our relationships with God are, are, are broken or, or distanced. Usually that translates into our relationships with one another. That our love for God should drive our love for one, uh, one another. Because we cannot have a great relationship or a great marriage apart from a great relationship with God. But the hard times of marriage should drive us to experience more of the transformative love that comes from God. So we get to see a, a small measure of God's love and exemplify a small measure of God's love when we're able to love well. But ultimately, we have to come to a place where we understand and we admit that we need God. That if our marriage is based on anything other than a foundation of love that comes from God, then it will not last. That we cannot be a better spouse or fiance or boyfriend or girlfriend or friend without God. You must first, we must first turn our life over to Him and live for Him. And it's out of our love for God that we in return can love others because the more we become like God, the more we're able to love like God. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge that I am challenged with myself. That's the challenge that I pose to you as well as we close. If you would go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes this morning. 
that I don't ever want to move forward without an opportunity to give you a chance to give your life to Christ. And if you're in this space and you've never given your heart over to God, we cannot be better people until we come to a place where we've given our lives to Christ, where we give up self. We die to self and we live for Christ. So if you're in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you in this moment to make the commitment, to make the choice. Say, I choose. I choose from this day forward to follow Christ. Just in your seats where you are, say, I choose from this day forward to follow Christ. For those of you in this room, if you're single, my prayer for you is that you become the person that God has called you to be. Don't try to chase being someone else. That you be strong. That you have strong morals. That you don't compromise your life to win the approval of others. But that you stand strong in who you are, who God has called you to be. And that you prepare your life, you prepare to be the person that someone else needs. If you're here and you're married, If your spouse is in the room, go ahead and take her by the hand. Don't take someone else's spouse by the hand, but if your wife is in the room, go ahead and take her by the hand. I want us to commit this morning to love like Christ. I want to pray this over you and your marriage. God, I thank you that you give us the power to love well. I thank you for my spouse. We thank you for the spouses in this room or maybe their home or, or wherever, Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you that you're for us and that you fight for us. We thank you that you have good in store for us and so we confess that marriage is tough. We confess that that's an understatement. Marriage is hard and we make mistakes. But Father, give us the ability to turn to you to provide for us all that we need. We ask that you would make us more like you in the process. So fill our marriages, fill our homes, fill our families, fill our lives with truth and cover it with blessing. So Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. If you would go ahead and stand across the room.